Andrew Jenkins. Hello. Yeah. How are you? Hello. You okay? Yeah, not too bad. You must have had the most mad couple of weeks, I think, of your life. <laughs> it has been a bit surreal, yes. It has, yeah. Really surreal. And um, sort of, you're back to work now, aren't you? <laughs> in the loosest sense of the term, yeah, I, I am. I, my body is there sometimes, but my mind is all over the place. So uh, I'm off. I say I should have booked a week off. Really, looking at high hindsight is a great thing. I should have booked a week off, maybe two, but I, I've got today and tomorrow off work. So I was in work yesterday. And how has it been, sort of getting back in that mindset after you've, you know, had this wild ride of the the traitors? I've tried. I'm quite a grounded guy, to be honest. Keep my feet. Try to keep my feet on the floor. You know, it's, it's difficult because. Everywhere you go, every single pay, but everywhere you go, you get recognized everywhere now, which is and it's fun. I like talking to people. I like I'm a talkative guy and I like chatting to people, really. I've I always have done. So I like meeting people, I'm selfies, and it's good. You know, but I've tried to try and get back to normality really and try to um, you know, spend time with my family, my son, and try and get back into work. But it is it's been a bit difficult. Were you aware that your life could change? Um, before before you went on the show, were you were you sort of um, did you did, because I'm guessing you were a fan of the first series and, and watched that. Um, were you aware yeah. that your life was gonna gonna change? I I knew it was gonna be busy, but I didn't realize how big the show. I don't think anybody realized how big the show. I watched the first series. I loved the first series. I was totally immersed in it, and that's why I I, I got to pinch myself now to say that actually I was on the actual second series. So I still it still hasn't sunk in. I don't think properly. It's not going to sink in. I don't think for another. A couple of months, I don't think, but um, I loved it. Yeah, so I didn't realize it's going to be so as big as it was. I don't think. I don't think even the BBC realized how big it was going to be or Studio Lambert. And actually, sort of watching the reaction episode to episode, um, because I I speak for everyone when I say as soon as that third episode went at the end of each week, we were like, no, I can't believe we're going to wait that long for the next one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What What was yeah. that like? What was it like watching the reaction live? It was surreal. I was watching it back. I say we we obviously haven't seen the edited version, so for us it was new. Watching it, I was watching it the same as you guys, the same as the viewers, really. And I, I was on the edge of my seat as well. I, I couldn't. It was so hard for me to wait the full uh, the week read to uh, full the full like four or five days to the next week episode. But then, you know, funny how people were messaging me, speaking to me in the street. Oh, so what happens next? What happens next? I know they always start off with a classic line. They always say, "I know you probably can't say anything." But everybody who stops me, I know you couldn't say, I know you can't say anything, but. So it was really, it was exciting. It was good. It, and it sounds a bit big, but it, it brought like people together, I think. I know that's a bit of a bold statement, but there was, you know, people in work were talking about it. The families were get together on the, they're on, you know, in the living room watching the program. And it brought lots of people together, which is amazing the impact it had on people. It's because it's unlike, I think, any other reality series isn't it mm. i think you you watch it and it really is a, it's like a character study <laughs> yeah I don't, i'm not into it it's funny i don't i don't watch any reality tv i watch i'm a celebrity and i also watch sas who dares wins but apart from that i don't watch any other reality tv so i don't i know it was reality tv but it's not like not it's like it's a new it's a different type of reality tv if you know what i mean it's not it's not the same sort of thing as like love island or something like that so it's a bit I don't know, it's, not so it's a bit better, I think. It's not so much a reality TV, but no, it's good. And um, like, so what, talk, talk us through the, the, the filming kind of process. So, so when did you shoot Series 2? It was, it was last autumn, wasn't it? Yeah, we filmed it in September last year. Yeah, that's when it was filmed. And um, the, the actual process of filming the show. Um, so were you, um, so, so you go up to Scotland. Talk to us through the day-to-day -day routine of um, filming. It's pretty much the same same format every day, really. Um, obviously, in the, we, you go to the obviously the castle, you're in the castle, and then you, you don't know if you're going to go for breakfast or not, or you go to breakfast, you have a bit of reality TV where you talk amongst you know, amongst each other for a couple of hours or so, and then the mission takes a big chunk of your day, really. So you know, that, that takes a long time to film. They normally have to travel to the set, uh, which takes you know, a couple of minutes or 40, 50 minutes, however far the set is. You have to travel to the location to film the uh, mission. And then by the time you've got to do the health and safety brief then, um, you know, get ready for the mission. That takes up a huge chunk of the day. After the mission, then really you've got to go back to the castle, uh, have a shower normally because we're pretty pretty dirty normally. So we have a shower, a bit of tea, uh, a bit of dinner, and then uh, a little bit of reality again. This to the round table. Then so we go to the round table, uh, and then we film the round table. This back into the bar. Then when the round table finishes, is the round table as intense as it looks on screen? I think in real life, I think it's worse. It goes on a little bit longer. Obviously, they've condensed everything down to a one-hour show. But in real life, I think it goes on 
quite a bit longer than that. He went on for about 40 minutes, I think, in real life. But um, and, it, and it is intense. And um, but I think this year, I don't know why. It seemed I think we all seemed a bit more respectful towards each other. I didn't think mm. really, anybody really had a big argument or got heated. It wasn't. It was intense at some points, and there were a couple of tears. But I don't think it's as bad after watching the first series. And I watched the first series again before I went in there. I think it was a lot more dramatic and a lot more arguing, a lot more tears than in series one. Whereas this series, whether because we knew what, what what to expect or whether we were we did get on really well as a group. The whole twenty two of us got on really well. It's a TV show as well, and I think there's going to be people who watch it and think, you know, are these people playing up to the cameras, all that type of thing. But were the emotions around that table, were they real? Everything you see, everything you see on TV is real. People say to me, do they, do they tell you what to say? Do they tell you what to do? I said, not 100%. They don't. They don't tell you any. Don't get me wrong. They tell you where to stand and things and what, you know, what to do. But they don't tell you what to say or how to act and everything. So everything you see, the breakfast scene, for example, when you walk into breakfast, them reactions are real. You don't know who's been murdered or what, the traitors do, obviously, but the people, other people don't know who's been murdered and if you come into breakfast or not. So when you see the people reacting in a shocked way, that's 100% genuine and real. And so everything, the round table is real. Yeah, it's all real. It's all genuine. I was actually going to ask about breakfast. That was something that was on the forefront of my mind. Um, it looks lush. It looks really amazing on camera. Apparently, yeah. it's not that good. Well, <laughs> well, obviously, if you watch the show, every scene I meet in, so everybody has messaged me every time. You always eat it on camera, <laughs> so I was. I obviously I found it quite nice, but um, the rest of the cast didn't find it that nice. But I, it was nice. It was just cold, nice cheeses, meats, and just it's like a continental breakfast. Really cold meats. It's not, it wasn't hot at all. It was all cold stuff. But uh, I thought it was okay. I've heard it was quite dry. <laughs> I've read some interviews with people saying it's quite a dry <laughs> breakfast. That's the one it, thing it is. that's letting it down. Yeah. It is a dry breakfast. Yeah, it was quite dry, but I love brie. So I, I, normally, I, I eat quite healthily because I do a lot, quite a lot of training. And I know my diet is quite boring and bland anyway. So I'm I'm used to dry, boring, and bland. So uh, it was home from home for me, really. So you know, you you go into breakfast, um, you wait to see who has been um, murdered by the by the traitors, and then yeah. the force of nature that is Claudia Winkleman comes uh, in the room. What was it like filming with Claude? She, she's an amazing, she's an, a, such a lovely person. I, I, I can't say I, I, she makes a show really. I don't think anybody else could do it. Uh, anybody else? Could, she just she's she's dark, but she she's love she's the loveliest person you can meet. She's like down to earth. I'd love to have a drink. I can imagine going up for a normal but drink in a pub with her and having a bit of fun and a joke. And she's a lovely person, but she does make the she plays the role superbly well. And she used to come in every morning and say a little sarcastic comment about who wasn't that who been murdered, and then she tell us a little clue about the, the, the trial we had that day. Then. Um, Andrew, you you've said this before, probably, but why yeah. did you sign up for the traitors in the first place? What why what why did you want to get involved with this? You said you're a fan of the first series, and there's going to be a lot of people who, like myself, were watching the second series and were like, "I want a bit of that. I want to go on that show." He, you know, he's yeah. very very lucky. Um, yeah. Why did you want to sign up in the first place? Like you just said, I I loved the first series. I thought I watched the first series back, and I thought, well, I'd be quite good at that. I'd like I joked to my family to be honest. We watched the first series, and we had our own little game in the house where the family we all drew names out of a hat. Faithful traitor. One of us was a traitor. We went on for a few days around where we lived in the local village. We had to um, we walked around. We went to the restaurants, pubs. We had a little. We played the game. So that's how much immer- that's how immersed we were as a family. So we loved it. And when I when I was uh, messaged on my Instagram page then in March a casting person messaged me saying, would you like to apply for it? I thought it was a bit of a joke, really. But I thought, well, really? Yeah, go on, I'll try it. And it, it was a step out of my comfort zone, really, because all for the last couple of years, I've been on a, a huge journey, a, a personal journey, I suppose, developing myself and growing as a as a person, understanding myself better. And I've all, you know, started to take 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 opportunities, really, whereas over the last 20, 30 years, I, w- I wouldn't step out of my comfort zone. I was, I'd only do things I knew I was going to be good at or be successful at. I was scared of failure growing up and things. And I just thought, no, I'll go for it. I, was, I, I, would, I didn't never thought for the world I'll get on it. I never thought I'd get a chance to get on it. What I think was really amazing with you is that you do go on such a journey um, throughout the series. And I think I think you said on Uncloaked that you uh, had such a, uh, a, a varied experience on the show. Yeah. You, you got to do everything. You know, you were a yeah. traitor. You were a faithful. Um, yeah. So, and then, and then there was one scene in particular 
where you got quite emotional, you got quite upset, uh, you yeah. opened up about your um, mental health. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, the, the, I don't want to be a celebrity. I don't want to be famous. I, I, I didn't do it for that. I did it, I did it to show people. I want to be able to prove to people who had a trauma, who had a you know, difficult life forever, to say, keep believing, keep dreaming, and you can't achieve your goals. You know, try, I want to try and break the stigma. I genuinely believe that my story this might sound a bit bold or a bit big, not big-headed, it might sound a bit of a bold statement, but I, I genuinely believe my story can change people's lives and help save thousands of lives, really. And, you know, a big, strong, hard rugby boy like me, you know, I can talk. I, I'm not, I, I show my vulnerable side. I mean, and for 20 years, I wore a mask. I never talked to anybody about my accident. I know I know spoke to my family about the accident for the first time seven months ago. So it happened 24 years ago. But um, in my family, are amazing. We've got a really amazing, close family. I have three brothers, two older brothers, one younger brother. But we just... We, Nobody made us like that. We just brought up in an era where you just don't talk or show feelings or emotions because you think it's a sign of weakness or you're not a real man. It doesn't make you strong. So I want to try and dispel that myth and show people that just because you talk or open up with your feelings, it doesn't make you less of a person or weak or anything. It actually makes you stronger, I think, to open up. So I, I thought it was a great platform to obviously help try and help towards what I want to do in the future, really, with the mental health and break the stigma and well-being. And what, what do you want? from this now you know you, you've had this phenomenal platform um i don't think there's anyone in the country who doesn't know who you are now thanks to this show yeah. um what yeah. would you what would you like to see what what would you like to do you know is it more of that kind of trying to end the stigma with mental health uh, what, what 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 would you like to see happen next my, as you can imagine that it's crazy the last last week since it all come out it's a bit it's a bit of a whirlwind at the moment and i've obviously speaking to lots of different people and they I, I need to sit down when things maybe calm down slightly. Um, yeah, and, and really think about what it is I want to do. I I say I want to help everybody, but I know I can't help everybody because I'm just I'm only me on my own. But I'd like to perhaps do radio, television interviews, public speaking is another thing. I've I've started doing that before. I went on the traders, talking to corporate companies or anybody, just supporting people. You youngsters, I could help. You know, young people in sport, perhaps who've had an injury or get dropped from academies. This is a cutthroat industry. I know lots of people in sport academies, youngsters who get dropped from their academy by a text message with no follow up on them, you know, no, no feedback. If a young child or a young teenager, that's devastating to be one minute. You think you're, you're on top of the world. You're going to play professional sport, professional rugby, football, cricket, whatever. And all of a sudden they get dropped by a text message with no follow up or feedback. So I can speak to lots of different demographic of people. I believe like lots of fire service people. I know lots of firemen or lots of, you know, ambulance people. They must see so much trauma. What support do they get? You know, mm. I, I speak to some firemen, who, who, uh, three, a guy I spoke to, he witnessed three horrific accidents in a year. All he had off the people was a generic email to say, if you want, if you want to help, ring this number. A generic email, he should, have a, he should be sitting down with somebody and talking to somebody face to face, how he's feeling. Mm. And I think, you know, it's a bit drastic and a bit dramatic maybe, but I'm thinking to myself, you know, these people, they're not, they're not going really, to they're not going to talk. A lot of people don't, they bottle things up like I did. So they bottle things up you know, things get worse and worse and worse. It only takes one more thing to make that person snap. And how many people out there, you know, think about taking their own lives? And but if they've been if they've been helped much sooner, how many lives could be saved in the country in the world by the, having the right um, support network around you and having the right support and guidance and you know being be made to feel comfortable and not not a stigma attached to talk about it, open up. You know, I, I can believe when I like the fireman I spoke to said he said three generic emails that everybody has when they once they've witnessed something to say. Oh, if you want to speak to somebody, this is the number or email this. And, you know, he, and he's not going to do that. He didn't do that. He said, he, I said, did you talk to anybody? He said, no, I didn't talk to anybody. That's three things in a year. And how many more things before he breaks, before something happens? And, you know, and he tries to take his own life, maybe, or, you know, death through suicide or something, you know, something like that. And, and, you know, doctors, nurses, nurses witness traumatic childbirth, for example. How much support and guidance do they get? Mm. So there's so many people out there who witness, you know, lots, not just, you know, I'm going to have a car accident. It could be any type of trauma, really. Um, but I'm, as you can tell, I'm really passionate about it. I really want to help and change the, change, people, change, not change the world, but I really want to help change people and change. And how I do that at the moment is a bit up in the air. There's so many ideas I'd like to do. Just getting my name out there really, and talking. And, and you know, people have had lots of good feedback so far off. You know, lots of people, have hundreds of nice, amazing messages of people saying you're an inspiration. You're breaking the stigma. I, I, as a result of watching you on the telly, I've done this, I'm doing this, I talk to my child, I talk to my son. So that makes me feel really good inside, knowing what I'm doing. I don't want fame, I don't want to be famous. It's nice being recognised in the street, but I want to help people at the end of the day, and I'm hoping, you know, I need to sort out exactly what I need to do to do that. 
after my accident, after my coma, and after I was in hospital, they offered me counselling or to see somebody because what I, the injury I had was horrendous. Mm. They said, you've got to have to see somebody. And I declined it because back 24 years ago, I thought I'd see some person in a white coat. They would judge me, psychoanalyze me, get inside my head. I, I didn't want to see a professional. I couldn't talk to my family about it because A, you're putting them through enough as it is. Do you feel bad for that? And also, my, we just don't talk about emotions. I don't see my family show any emotional you know, hug each other or love each other. They, I know we do. I know we love each other. We're really close. And if I needed any of my family, they'd be there for me straight away. But we just don't talk about emotions and feelings and things like that. So I couldn't talk to my family. I couldn't talk to my the doctor, a psychologist. So I had nobody to talk to. I bottled it up. But I, so I bottled it up for 20 odd years. And I didn't feel ready. I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't, just didn't feel ready about it. The longer time goes on then, the harder things get. The longer things go on, the, la- the harder it is. So eventually I met the man who saved my life. I say it was a man who saved my life. There was a team of people around him, but he was the main surgeon. So I met mm-hmm. him last year. And that, that, that was the final, not final nail in my coffin. That just gave me the, the kick up the backside, I suppose. Thinking, look, you know, start, instead of looking back on life or what I've lost, my rugby career, my looks and all this sort of thing, start looking forward and I can, I can, I can use this trauma to help people. It's called, it's called trauma, post, post-traumatic growth, where you've had a trauma in life, but then off the back of that, you're doing good things as a result of it. It's like you know, people in the Paralympics, for example, they lose their leg in Afghanistan, you know, and now they're in the Paralympics. Maybe they wouldn't have been good enough to compete in the able-bodied Olympics, but now they're, they're competing in the Paralympics. So even though you know, nobody wants to trauma, if I wish, I wish it never happened to me. But as a result of this, now I wouldn't be speaking to you, for example. I wouldn't be on the traitors. I wouldn't be helping thousands of people. I would have still been a rugby boy. I don't know what I've been doing. It's all ifs and buts. It is, but I would have. Been, I don't know what life I would have had. I'm having a better life now as a result of it. And I suppose, it, it, has it been a process for you where you have grown more confident about being able to talk about what happened and, and you, you know, you, you become more um, open about the, the events of what happened? Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely. Obviously, it took me, it took me about 20 years to talk. And I, you know, I got three brothers. On the, on the Friday night, I spoke to my mother and father on the Friday night about the accident. I said, I wanted to start putting videos on social media and talking about things. So, I didn't want my family to find out of third party. I wanted to tell them myself because it, it involves them. It's a big, it was a very stressful part. You know, I can't, I can't, I can't think of what my mother was, my father were going through, my brothers were going through at the time, being told, you know, I was going to be a, a wheelchair for the rest of my life. I won't be able to walk, talk, recognize anybody ever again. And the trauma they went through, it must've been horrendous for them. But like, so you know, it took me 20 years, but I, I wanted to start talking to people. So on the Friday night, I spoke to my mother and father. And then I talked about it, what I wanted to do and everything. And they said, oh, you just changed after your accident, you changed. I said, but you didn't ask me why. Why did I change? Because I, I've done a lot of you know, qualification, a lot of study in the things over the last couple of years. I've qualified as an NLP practitioner, neuro linguistic programming. So I've done a lot about this sort of thing. And basically, what it was is it, it sounds crazy when I say it out loud now, but at the time it was very true. I, I, all the only way I thought of making my family proud was playing rugby, winning things. So for five years of age twenty one, rugby was my my identity. I suppose when I lost my identity, I thought perhaps. My dad doesn't love me anymore. I can't make my dad proud anymore. My, par- my family proud anymore. My, my three brothers are still playing rugby as well. They're very good standard. My oldest brother has a couple of Wales A rugby caps. We're all, we're, all good, we're all good rugby players. So they were all still playing rugby at the time. So, you know, they were still playing rugby. So I thought my brothers are better than me. I thought my dad loved my brothers better than me. So I, I changed. I, um, every Sunday, my mother used to do a, like a big family tea where all my family come around, the girlfriends, the wives, the children. And my mother makes a huge buffet, a big buffet. And my, all the boys end up in one room with my dad, normally watching Scrum Five, talking about rugby. And all the, all the girls and the girlfriends end up my mum in the other room. So we, I, we were all sitting in the one room and my brothers were still were talking about the game, the, the, the match they played the day before. I played rugby yesterday, I've done this. And I'm sitting there thinking, what can I talk about? I've got nothing to contribute to this conversation. What, and what can I talk about? And it was rugby, sport, sport, sport. And I wasn't doing any sport. So, so I thought I, just, I, I, I didn't think I fit, not fitted in. Yes, yeah, so that, that's, that's what it was, the main thing. You know, so that was the big thing. Like, so I, I spoke to them. I said, I didn't, I didn't change. I said, I just thought I didn't have anything to say, contribute to the conversation and that. So wow. I spoke to my family about the accident. And then I spoke to my son on the Saturday morning there. We had a four-hour chat in a coffee shop in Cardiff. And he's 22 years of age. I said, look, we need to have a conversation. You're a grown man now. What do you know about my accident? He said, I don't know anything about your accident. He said, all my life, I've wondered where your scars were, but I didn't want to ask you. He said, I asked my mother a few times, but she said, you're too young. I'll tell you when you're older. Mm. So I, I, my son didn't know about it. And at the end of that conversation with my son, I hugged him. I told him I loved him for the first time in his life, I think. So, um, yeah, so sorry. Um, yeah, so I hugged him and I told him I loved him. And I told him I was proud of him no matter what. So I, I've never said that to him in 22 years. So I'm hoping 
I don't. I said I don't care if you play rugby. I don't care how big your house is. I don't care what car you drive. As long as you're a nice person, that's what make that's what's important to me. So I'm hoping. Whereas I grew up thinking I had to achieve things in life and do things in life. I'm hoping I've taken a bit of pressure off him. No, so 100. Drug- See, I broke the broke the mold. Broke the mold. Broke. Broke that like cycle, I suppose, of like being big, strong, macho men. And um, you know, I, looking back over the years, some of the things I've said to my son after a game of rugby, like someday it, when you play rugby and you've had a bad game, you know you've had a bad game. You don't need your dad to tell you've had a bad game. Like sometimes he's come off the pitch, and he's he, the one person he probably wants consoling off and comforting from. And I said, "Oh, you played rubbish." Then. Or I, I got in the car. Sometimes I've left the ground before he's even finished the match. So mm. I can imagine after the game, he's looking for me. I'm not even there. And so I feel awful. I've done things like that. So I, I'm, I'm much more self-aware now than I was. Or back a few years ago, but so I'm hoping now. And I spoke, you know, so we had a great conversation. Then I spoke to my brother in the afternoon on Saturday, my oldest brother. I spoke to my other brother on Sunday, and my other brother on a Monday. So the weekend was like a therapy weekend, really. And and but all my brothers wanted to ask me the same questions. We all wanted these questions answered for twenty odd years, but they didn't want to start a conversation with me because they didn't want to trigger anything. Or they they felt awkward. I didn't want to talk to them. So it was like, when I had the conversation, it was like talking to my mates. It was like, it was a good conversation. They're all very supportive and they understand me. They understood me better. Mm-hmm. No, well, that's, that's, that is such a, that's such a brilliant story. And I think that it's, you know, it really kind of shows your growth and how the accident sort of, you know, it's almost, it, it's like, it's mad, isn't it? How something traumatic like that has suddenly made you, well, it's made you, made you, like you said, a better person than yourself. Yeah, I'm still not there. Don't get me wrong. I'm still not. I'm not perfect. I'm far from perfect. I'm still working on myself. But I'm better than I was yesterday, last week, the last year, five years. I'm a different person completely than I was. You know, I'm changing all the time. I'm growing and trying to be a better person. I, I am a better person, much better person than I was. I had massive issues for 20 years. My confidence, my self-esteem. I lost all my confidence, all my self-esteem. I hated what I saw in the mirror. I say some horrendous things to myself on a daily basis, telling my thing, telling myself how ugly I was. Nobody's ever going to want to be with me. Horrendous. I, I look like a freak. And obviously telling yourself over and over and over again every day, eventually you start to believe that. And like you, I, things I say, I would never say these things to my son, my mother, my, my brother, my best friend. But I tell them to myself every single day. I used to tell myself every single day these things. So that was breaking the cycle of stopping, saying little comment, even though you think it's a little comment or you're stupid poor, or whatever, calling yourself silly things. Just little things, just stop doing little things. Like that. And I think lots of people out there, do say stupid things to themselves and your brain will take that in eventually your unconscious mind will remember all these things you're saying to yourself so you know stop saying that you know i stopped saying that a few years ago wow and andrew i think um a perfect place for uh us to um finish i mean we've got a couple more questions just on the traitors if that's okay um yeah, yeah. do you uh have any regrets from going on the show at all not at all, no. Not at all. Looking at the feedback I'm getting, the people out there I'm helping, it's had the exact effect that I wanted. I got no regrets. I'd re- re- anyway, it's difficult. Don't get me wrong. The show is difficult. It's mentally and physically draining. But I, I've had so many experiences from it. I met 21 great people. Um, I've done it in a helicopter. I've heard Claudia Winkleman, for God's sake. I, mean, I, I, I wouldn't. There's nothing I regret about going on the show. I met amazing people. Everybody's Plank PR are amazing. The production team, Studio Lambert, every single person involved in the show is incredible. I take my hat off to every single person. They make the show and they look after the staff. They look after the, the cast so well. You know, well-being is at the forefront of everything and they really looked at it. It's a, good, it's a great team. Um, Finally, a quick fire quiz, uh, Andrew, just, <laughs> just about you. Um, So okay. all time, so just quick answers, really, really quick. Um, no pressure. All, all time hero. Michael Jordan. Favourite Welsh word. <laughs> lovely um hidden talent mm, uh hidden talent <laughs> oh i can lift a lot of weight <laughs> that's not a hidden talent hey, i mean do you know what have it I, I can't do it so i mean <laughs> lift a lot I of weight lift a lot of weight yeah tv guilty pleasure and i won't accept the traitors a film you, you, you can yeah you can say film tv any guilty kevin pleasure? and perry i like i love watching kevin and perry it's just a simple stupid kevin and perry go large the film it makes me laugh and it's funny ultimate comfort food peanut butter oh wow that is that is quite a random one go to karaoke Lots. song it's gotta be a tom jones to be obviously being welsh is it i think i can sing when i'm out in the karaoke so a tom jones song i think or or the green green grass at home is why i normally sing in the rugby club Best thing about Wales? The people. 
three perfect dinner party guests? James Corden, Peter Kay, and Michael Jordan. I'm I'm hearing this, Michael Jordan. You're loving Michael Jordan. Um, top amazing. song on your Spotify playlist. It's a song. It's quite a personal song. It's Jesse J. I can't remember the name of it. <clears throat> who you are? I think it's called. It's a song about you know being who you are and don't look in the mirror. When you look in the mirror and you're know, feeling being, being feeling good about yourself, basically, it's a really good, powerful song. Tony's or Dorothy's? Oh, Dorothy's. Yeah, do you know what? I agree. Cardi- can carry off the floor. Oh, Cardiff or Swansea? <laughs> you can't ask me that. I can. I work in Cardiff City. Uh, Cardiff. Oh, lovely. Correct answer. Halloween or Christmas? Christmas. Night in or night out? In. At the moment. I'm old. In. <laughs> Banished or murdered? Murdered. Neither. I just want the money. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. Welsh rugby or Welsh football? Rugby. Rugby. Um, and uh, th- that's the end of the quickfire quiz. Well done, Andrew. Um, and, and just finally, <laughs> do you resent Harry in any way? Because I personally, if he just nicked 95 grand from me. <laughs> he never, I never had the money. <laughs> you never had the money, no. but do you know what I mean? You, no. you were that close. No, to be honest, no, I don't, I don't resent him at all. He's a really good guy. I got a lot of time for Harry. He's a good, he's like, I'm like his dad. I was like him and Molly's dad. I was, he's the same age as my son, for example, and Molly's younger than my son. So they kept, they kept calling me dad in there. So I was like, it was like having two children in there, two adopted kids. Thank you for listening. Don't forget, you can keep up to date with all the latest TV and showbiz news by subscribing to our newsletter over at walesonline.co.uk. 